Do I need this right in front of me, or could I put it down here? Yeah, whatever you prefer. Oh, okay. And you can't really see me if it's here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that makes sense. OK, <laughs> well, let's go. Who's ever leading? We have an unse. Okay, we begin with prayers. You're in the Praise to Shakyamuni Buddha. <laughs> Teacher, O destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, O destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, do I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, do I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. 
to you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face yes, like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, ominous and teacher, real devotion like some good qualities, to the best scar I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the ego gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, for the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, while abiding in the home, pure training, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds, look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this mirror, having attained the state of the all-seeing, thereby subduing the enemy of false, May I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I obtain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings be abiding in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous action of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen. May I obtain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jewel mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O my masters, my edoms, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessing. Edom, Guru, The Heart of Perfection Wisdom Sutra, I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on the mass of Vulture's Mountain on Raj Dihara, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? 
He said that. And the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharyaputra. Sharyaputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment. Bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in no wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond air, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas dwell in the three times, also manifestly, completely awakened to unsurpassable, perfect life, in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, a mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Gata, 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 paragata, parasam gata, bodhisoha. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commanded the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you've indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharaputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Thank you. Uh, Dana, could you turn down the air a couple of degrees? Uh, it's good to have like some air flow. Um, maybe Jules, you could turn on the um, uh, air purifier. 
Oh, Sue, you beat Jill's to it. <laughs> so in the monastery, you'd be punished for doing someone else's job. Because then we take away someone's merit, right? So now you have to transfer the merit to Jules. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, I respect that everyone's, uh, you know, we're trying to do best practices, but also having some airflow. So wearing, maybe wearing a sweater is less than um, getting the Delta variant, right? Or, so um, I hope. I assume we're all vaccinated, right? We're doing that. So thank you for that. It's kind of duh. Um, since I'm married to a nurse who deals primarily right now with COVID patients and a sister-in-law who works for the state of Washington to give out COVID information um, and uh, help people to get to testing sites, I, I'm in constant contact with Dr. Altshuler feel pretty covid it up. But uh, we can only do what we can do, right? You know, within reason, we have to take care of our health too, right? So, um, not, um, Sabrina said, uh, this virus likes fat and sugar. <laughs> so <laughs> don't get diabetes, you know? So we have to take care of ourselves like that. And um, it's better not to, um, if we have COPD or other lung things. Although uh, somebody was telling me recently that um, this, like, cigarette smokers are less likely to get, I don't know, does that make sense? I don't know, I don't think that makes sense. <laughs> Maybe they're a smoker. <laughs> so, I, I, <laughs> I think whatever you're smoking right now probably uh, is enough with the air, right? So we don't need to, you know, so whatever. Um, um, uh, I'm trying to look down occasionally to say hello to the people um, that are remote and they have uh, nice faces. So, um, but uh, I don't know if it rotates a little bit or is this, that's like on the screens, is that the entire no number of people on remote? This is everybody. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, good. So, hello, <laughs> hello, hello. Which camera, right? This camera? Yeah. Okay. And then sometimes that camera, right? Yeah, everyone's on. Yeah, that's cool. So, appreciate people that um, are tuning in remotely. But I'm, uh, I'm aware that like last time the hearing wasn't so good, right? So, how's the mic doing? Good? A little higher? Well, just speak up, right? New York voice. <laughs> Out here, it's good. Usually, like in the therapist's voice, because real soft, like that. <clears throat> well, I'll try. So today, I wanted to uh, talk about um, uh, grasping that uh, link in the uh, interdependent chain of rebirth and also uh, say a little bit about Amitayas. Um, it turned out Ken Shrimshe had some prior engagements, uh, but uh, I will be asking him to come back uh, hopefully next month or in October. Um, the people that were lucky enough to uh, have the initiation, um, most people are here. Anybody here that didn't, wasn't able to attend the initiation? Everybody? That's good. <clears throat> so uh, the Amitai practice is, uh, uh, you know, very unique because it's um, considered uh, uh, highest yoga uh, practice, Amitara Tantra practice, <clears throat> which um, you know usually uh, when we're talking about highest level yoga, we're talking about the big tantras. Um, like Kala Chakra, um, Chakra Sambara, Guri Samaja, um, Guri Garba, um, you know, Vajrayogini and so forth. Uh, 
which uh, you know are quite uh, elaborate, um, uh, and usually uh, those uh, come with some kind of uh, commitment. Um, It's nice uh, to take it as a blessing, but if you make a commitment to do it, then do it, right? <clears throat> uh, I like telling this story when uh, I did a um, Yamantaka, a wrathful Manjushri practice with the Dalai Lama in Long Beach. Um, uh, he was talking about commitments and people know this story, right? <laughs> He said, well, if you're going to do it, do it. If you're not going to do it, F it, right? So he said the whole word. And I was sitting next to Deb Dietz. And I know I heard it, but I just wanted confirmation. Like, did the Dalai Lama just F-bomb? Yeah. Um, so that uh, you know, is taken seriously. But this is um, a very unique um, practice um, because coming through um, a Dakini person, and uh, Kenshin Rimshe um, was willing to go into uh, the tantric style of practice where we're uh, doing all the um, offering mudras and uh, you know, offering all the substances. So uh, I'd, I'd like to wait until he comes back to like, you know, have him do it his way. Uh, and um, hope that soon. But, uh, Usually the highest, in, in our school, the highest uh, practices are usually accompanied by someone uh, committing to do a uh, you know, regular succession guru yoga practice. Um, that practice is some people have been doing for a while, and uh, there are various different translations, and they're long, it's long, <laughs> it's medium, so, um, Usually I just have time to do the medium uh, six times a day. Um, and uh, I use uh, Dr. Burson's translations. So sometimes use one translation, one another. It's funny, I'm just used to doing that. So, um, but that, uh, that's a standard practice. So um, you should know that. And if you want some teachings on that, I'll give that to you. Doesn't take very long, six times a day is um, uh, interesting. So, but usually um, I'm doing it three times in the morning and three times in the evening. And that usually just takes, I don't know, like six minutes. I mean, it's not very, it doesn't take very long, right? You know, so, but maintains uh, the, our peer view like that. Um, if that wasn't a, uh, there are many other uh, guru yoga practices, if that isn't the style you grew up with, of course, you know, I've done uh, guru yoga practices um, through Dujan and um, uh, you know, those are equally valid. But if you go to like another center that's in uh, Dalai Lama's tradition, you say, oh, I'm doing high uh, yoga practice. Usually wouldn't just blurt it out, but they're chatting, and they say, "Oh, that's really nice. You you want to stop by and this evening, and we'll do some uh, succession guru yoga together." And you go, "Oh, what's that?" <laughs> they go, "Who's your teacher?" <laughs> really, you don't do that. So that um, I like people to, uh, and uh, but we need some teachings on that, right? Because it's fairly esoteric, right? That, but doing high yoga tantra is fairly esoteric and requires um, the preparation. So, um, because of my long association and friendship uh, with Kenshin Rimshe and his confidence and Jada Rimshe's confidence in me and Sergei's, then uh, he um, consented to do for this group here because he knows that uh, I know the correct way to do the practice, which is first to have the training in uh, higher ethics to um, have, uh, keep the precepts um, uh, and generally uh, and develop bodhicitta, maintain bodhicitta, uh, and then uh, in our daily life too. Uh, 
and uh, then develop the meditative concentrations. Uh, so uh, that means you know, actually doing one's shamatha practice, tranquility practice, uh, shamatha vipassana technically, tranquility and insight, and then um, uh, <clears throat> uh, and third one is doing the wisdom teachings, right? So uh, the wisdom teachings mean we're looking directly into the nature of self and phenomena and mind. <clears throat> Which you think is more difficult? Is it more difficult to see nature of self, more difficult to see nature of phenomena, or more difficult to see nature of mind? <laughs> People have different styles. Uh, oh, seeing nature of mind is easy. <laughs> or I have a hard time finding out who I am, but I see nature of mind easy. Or, Understanding phenomena is easy. Well, I think it's all hard actually. <laughs> but uh, you know, particularly um, in uh, doing uh, tantra, and particularly doing uh, Mahamudra and Dzogchen, uh, you know, we're looking into nature mind. And unless you have uh, a good values uh, basis, uh, some kind of virtuous life, not Boy Scout, Girl Scout, but actually standard person and unless you have a strong uh shamta vipassana practice uh i've never seen anybody accomplish uh the higher teachings without having that you know and of course having a strong connection with uh, one's personal teacher so you actually get feedback feedback that sometimes isn't always what you want to hear but uh, what we need to hear so um but because kenshin uh you know, has that kind of trust in the Sangha, so you know, we have this Amitaya practice. Um, and uh, it, it is time to learn how to uh, do, you know, some of the, uh, obviously the offering mudras and to know what the ritual objects are. In the past, I've had people who, <laughs> who just run around and buy a bunch of stuff and then they don't know what it's for. So I haven't emphasized that over the last 10 years. Um, uh, but uh, now's a good time to do it. So um, probably uh, uh, searching around the still who has seemed to have the most uh, ease to work with and is Potalagate and Eugene, Oregon. Maybe some people have already purchased some things do them. Uh, I think it's just mail order now. I think they're closing down their store. But um, they seem pretty um, good mail order and uh, not super expensive. So there's some things I bought through Tibetan Treasures and Junction City or Tibetan Spirit Doctrine in Maryland, but the Telegate has um, what we need, right? So they have uh, Bell and Scepter. They have Damaru, they have a uh, you know, kind of rice um, container. We have a wooden, we have a wooden one, and my old one up on the shrine table, and then um, of course then we have a, a miniature kapala, right? You know, miniature uh, skull cup <laughs> about this big, right? So we put um, black tea. Sometimes people put alcohol, you know, and then make offerings, right? So getting the objects without spending a lot of money is really smart. So of course, Kenshin Rinpoche has uh, quite elaborate that he's given his uh, high talk, obviously, um, but uh, not, it's not necessary. It's better to have functional ones and use them, right? So they're not gathering dust. <laughs> so I really it's kind of informal today, so I have a question. Spell what? P O T A L A. Yeah. Patala, of course, we know the Patala in Tibet and um, Chen Rezi's um, abode, right? Yeah. And, uh, I still like. Um, uh, seeing tankas in person, you know, if possible. <clears throat> so 
most recent one generously donated is um, uh, uh, a small Tara over the Tara shrine. But that'd be appropriate Tara over there, so we moved. <laughs> Manjushu is very compliant. We moved Manjushu over <laughs> to the side. So uh, usually I associate the uh, Tankas with um, the teachers and uh, the initiation. So comes from doing Manjushu and so forth, and Kenjin Rinpoche doing um, a number of times Bajasattva. So I mentioned in the roar that Amitabha is, is not just long life as far as relative life goes, and long life and good health, so that we have enough time to practice and accumulate um, potentials for next lifetime, but uh, to unconditionally say yes. It, it seems harder sometimes when we put it that way. We all say, I want, and, you know, I want good health and long life, and you know, nice people to be around. But when I say, can you say unconditionally, yes, then has sometimes a little hesitation, don't you think? Can you feel kind of the yes, but? <laughs> yes, but, <laughs> but what about, you know, you have to say yes to, you know, um, so that, that but is, uh, what we would call like uh, grasping. You know, it's a little, you know, it just kind of. Um, so usually when you, when you think of grasping, of course we think of object, uh, and that's the easiest way to talk about object or addictions or something, but, um, or, you know, uh, holding on to emotions or holding on to objects, right? Or thoughts, right? So in the American mindfulness movement is so much about you know, not grasping onto thoughts or emotional states or grasping on to body, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, when, when we look deeper into the nature of mind, then uh, we see that uh, the grasping uh, happens on even more fundamental level. So the grass, can you still hear me? Am I might speak up more. <laughs> so, yeah, so, sometimes, you know, like, yeah, so the mic, so it should be more. Maybe mic a little bit, but I don't know, so. <clears throat> we, we could put, uh, we could maybe get people closer to, but that help, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it doesn't, yeah. <clears throat> so just speaking up helps, yeah. shouting probably. Just let go! <laughs> All right, are we done? The, um, the grasping, the fixation happens on very subtle uh, mind. Uh, and, and um, uh, you know, below uh, what we'd normally say is conscious level. So for those in the Buddhist Dharma study program who uh, uh, like reading Yogacara, there's uh, you know, a lot of, um, investigation of how that kind of sense of uh, self-grasping uh, happens, right? Um, uh, it's not just on the sensate level. So uh, it's on a very uh, deep level uh, of some kind of uh, fixation happens. I, uh, I like thinking of things that are trauma model sometimes, because uh, for me, samsara is like one long trauma. So uh, the Yogacara tantric idea a little bit is that, um, uh, you know, similar to uh, Dzogchen too, is that there's, there's some fundamental um, uh, fixation that happens. Um, uh, 
and uh, that happens uh, so quickly and in a way so naturally that um, you know we don't know it's happened. <clears throat> it's fairly easy to see fixation uh, on a gross level, but it's very difficult to see it on a very subtle level on, um, below the traditional uh, six consciousnesses, right? So everyone here at this point, you know what the six consciousnesses are, right? And then uh, in Yoga Chara, they say there's a seventh one, right? And then everyone should know what the eighth one is, sometimes um, it's called storehouse, right? Or alia. <clears throat> so at that level, uh, the grasping and the fixation uh, uh, is, is very profound because we don't know what's happened. <clears throat> but uh, in the uh, you know, Madhyamika school, uh, sometimes there's criticism of um, uh, Yogacara or the Aliyah principle because uh, sometimes it sounds like something is inherently there, right? Um, but I think when correctly understood, then it's, we can use that term, Aliyah. Vijnana, storehouse, um, uh, dualistic consciousness, and uh, realize that uh, it's a skillful uh, way to understand how ignorance and grasping work without thinking that there's some alia underneath everything, right? We can use that. Can we use that term without getting stuck on it? Let's just try. People get stuck on emptiness, right? <laughs> You're all searching for emptiness. <laughs> so uh, emptiness uh, uh, could be very elusive, like uh, searching for a unicorn. You like unicorns? Yeah, I do. So it's funny in our house when we bought the house. There's and Carmichael. There's um, a lot of a lot of glass uh, to open uh, ceiling. Um, in up high, there's uh, a unicorn uh, stained glass. It's embedded in the window, so there's one ping, and then it's it's in there. So uh, uh, we can see an image of the unicorn, but uh, we can never grasp it. So that's like emptiness. So you can see emptiness, seen kind of in an interesting way, um, but you can't grasp it. But sometimes we think we can grasp emptiness. <clears throat> so the grasping that uh, we're talking about in the 12 links, however, uh, in, in uh, this presentation is the grasping that impels us to generally to the next deluded life. So the concentration on uh, this style of dependent origination that we find in the wheel of life, like the tongue overlooking the doors, um, meant to drive home the fact that uh, unless we wake up to uh, and become Buddhas, we're, we're going to be uh, impelled and compelled and uh, impaled <laughs> by going, going into uh, the next situation uh, in a um, reactive and chaotic way. Doesn't feel good, does it? However, uh, there's a strong um, grasping or um, nostalgia for samsara, where we want to go back to an impulsive, um, instinctual world, right? Where, ah, I'm so tired of doing all these trainings. I, I just want to relax, right? I want to return to some kind of childlike place where we just want to finally do what we want to do. You ever have those feelings? That's a grasping too. Like it's, We're kind of grasping towards uh, uh, looking backwards as nostalgia for samsara. So even though we know ultimately no happiness to be found there, we sometimes think, well, just once, I, I just want to like <laughs> go out and just be myself, as we'd say in California, <laughs> right? Isn't that weird? You do all this dharma practice and then you go, Pamela, I, I just don't feel like I just want to be myself for a while. Can I cut back on doing the training? Going 
huh, what have you been doing? You know, like that. So that's a form of ignorance and grasping because we, we want to return uh, to some kind of state of mind that we thought is, you know, flowing, or at least we got to have, you know, our donut when we wanted our donut. And we got to have our donut and enjoy our donut, or a piece of cake, or drink, or read or something. And we think that we're being constrained, right? <clears throat> So another type of grasping is when we think that uh, we're being constrained by um, dharma. So uh, <clears throat> we're not. <laughs> that's that's a, that's a theistic approach, right? God or some absolute is over me, trying to uh, tell me what to do. <clears throat> so that's a kind of grasping. So I, I'm fine until someone tells me what to do. That's, that's a hard life, right? But that's also an inner, an inner voice, right? You have this inner, use Freudian terms, super, super ego, tell me what to do. And you have the id rebelling <laughs> when you're trying to mediate with your ego, you know. So that's a grasping when, uh, when you look at Dharma like, I'm not really doing what I want to do. I'm doing because I think it should be improving me. And I'm looking forward to some kind of enlightenment. But what I really want to do is just have a beer and sit by the pool. Isn't that weird? Do all this training and then just have a beer and sit by the pool. <clears throat> There's no Dharma police. We don't need Dharma police. Dharma police is called karma. So. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't have to be any dharma please right so that's a kind of grasping <clears throat> where we uh, think that uh, if, if we just kind of uh, sense a relaxation if we just kind of give in like that so in our style of practice we we actually see that our dharma practice as relaxing and liberating even though uh, at times the relaxation looks uh, difficult I know if I have a tight muscle and I'm getting massaged initially, it doesn't feel good, right? So, <laughs> so uh, but then ultimately it will lead to healthy relaxation. So I know that sometimes climbing the mountain is difficult, um, but then uh, when we ultimately relax and see nature of awareness, then uh, we realize the climb was worth it, don't you think? <clears throat> and, Translations into um, English, uh, we frequently use concept, uh, like the don't, don't engage in conceptual mind, right? But I, that's kind of a tricky word, and um, uh, there are so many words in Tibetan and Sanskrit that uh, talk about the function of mind that's involved in grasping, right? <clears throat> and I'd like to come up with another English word. Maybe, maybe, maybe Dirk has some ideas, you know? So uh, when we're translating and saying concept, we're, we're trying to talk about when there's been this um, diluted kind of fixation or grasping uh, that involves projection and, and unconscious ignorance all wrapped up. It doesn't mean um, now, when we're just using regular words that uh, we're being conceptual, it doesn't mean that uh, ordinary thinking uh, by itself is conceptual. Conceptual here refers to deep uh, structures that um, are generally uh, outside of uh, uh, normal investigation, right? <clears throat> so because they're outside of normal investigation, the deep uh, delusion, deep grasping, and you have to do the special training and the special uh, realizations. Otherwise, um, just ordinary consciousness, we won't see it. So that's why uh, we do a lot of training and practice, because ordinary uh, consciousness won't um, get to it. From beginning point of view, ordinary consciousness is really important to eliminate gross levels of grasping. So. And follow the precepts, and, and you have 
a simple enough life that we have time for a dharma, but uh, that's not enough. Uh, we need uh, higher teachings to unfold the uh, very subtle levels of grasping. Um, that we sometimes uh, talk about as concept. So now it's 11.51, um, maybe uh, uh, you've done something from this discussion, maybe not, but I find discussion helps bring things into clarity for me and for others, so maybe we can, we can do a little bit of that. Is that possible? What do you think? So it's whoever has the mic now rules, right? Do we still have the fan going on in the back? Why don't you check, Jill, see. All right. I think Ellen is probably, I think Ellen has the most first questions, don't you think? We should give a little, like, okay, for breaking, you know, kind of like being the shell, like just asking for the question, it's great. I do pride myself on being the, being the sacrificial question yeah, answer so when there's no good. other. That's good, thank you. Um, thank you for your talk, Lama. I have to admit that I have a pretty strong sensation for just wanting to have a beer and sit by the pool on regular occasions. And so I rely on structures that I put in place to sort of compel me, like Sunday, you know, come to Lion's Roar, because I might not be home practicing on my own if you aren't here. And so I guess my question is, is that like, okay, because we are going to have that tendency, aren't we, as long as we're still not enlightened? <laughs> Yeah, there's always going to be, you know, there, there's very subtle forms of grasping like that. Yeah, um, how about not, not so subtle? Uh, a funny kind of grasping is if, if we, this is not, this is California Dharma talk, but if we become in line, then we can really enjoy the beer by the pool uh, without negative consequences, right? That kind of thinking, that's, that's a grasping. <laughs> like that. So there's uh, there is a nostalgia for to return to some kind of uh, you know sensual uh, paradise. Like that. Well, I guess you know. I guess my underlying question is: Is it to be examined or resisted or just set aside along with the practice? You know, and that sort of ordinary life. And then there's the practice towards. A more enlightened way of being, or what is what is the job to be done when one notices that temptation or that tendency? When you know, so uh, we should ask us, you know, ourselves, you know, is it possible I could uh, sit by the pool and um, you know see the nature of awareness like that? Uh, because uh, what uh, happens uh, maybe a couple months ago I was talking about ordinary mind in a sense you know the, the, the neutral between pleasant and unpleasant so um, we've done a lot of training uh, uh, and then there's uh, uh, you know this kind of interesting spot where we just want to sit out by the pool or something and we have the thought okay I, I, I'm aware, like, I just want to kind of enhance it through, like, you know, doing a bowl or something or smoke or something. Then, but then we turn in the direction of nature mind, then it can be very profound, you see, because we're right, we're, we're, we brought ourselves right to that tipping point. So, uh, that, that can be used right there, whereas we think, um, a realization nature mind is going to come with some big broad experience but it actually comes with uh, just in that very ordinary moment where you kind of just want to space out and go F it you're, you're then using that as investigation so that's tantric style non Zogchen style like that so we don't necessarily have to go okay I'm, I'm bad I, I just you know, wanted to have a beer and 
you know, I'm bad or F it, you know, I, I'm, I'm so caught up in this stupid precept thing and Dharma thing and if I just have a beer, it'll just go away. And so that's, that's silly, right? It doesn't go anywhere, but we can actually, you know, that, that's a subtle, uh, very direct moment to see uh, nature and awareness like that because then we, we see the contrast. So as some of you know, I'm very impartial to, um, uh, you know, seeing contrast and seeing uh, 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 this, uh, the turning within and looking, you know, so uh, a little bit Madhyamaka style. I, I like for people to hold the contrast together evenly uh, so that they can see the real great Madhyamaka, the great nature mind. So it's, it's neither this nor that, you know, look right in the center. But um, uh, we have to bring the struggle out in the open, and lots of times the struggle is very subtle. You know, we, we just want to, like, slide back a little bit. So it's, once again, it's not like um, um, <laughs> there's Dharma police or something, you know, so, uh, or there's not like, Oh my God! I just broken countless samayas, so now I, you know, I want to turn in all my dharma objects to lions. <laughs> People do that, you know. Like I don't know, like maybe last year, maybe it was Susan. I don't know. Like somebody brought a whole box, couple boxes. Like somebody just gave me these boxes. They're giving away all their dharma stuff. You know, so that would be really extreme, right? So um, when 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 we lose the subtle moment, then uh, we have to have a sense of humor, a sense of self-compassion, right? So that's the proper thing, you know, not like Dharma beat up, you know, that on top of our normal kind of neurotic, dysfunctional family of origin beat up, then you have Dharma beat up, you know, that, that doesn't do any good, right? So a sense of humor, <laughs> like, whoa, okay, all right, you know, and, and then, and you can do some self-soothing, right? Um, but uh, a lot of times, seeing nature of mind uh, doesn't doesn't happen in extreme moments where you know we're just like someone's holding a gun at our head or we're about to jump off a cliff or something. Uh, those make good stories, and lots of times those are the stories that are preserved in biographies and Zen koans and stuff like that. But um, you know, many times it, it's it's just more tricky and subtle like that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, also, Dirk does have a question. Does okay, have a good. Question? Hi. Hi. Uh, can you actually hear me? Yeah, very good. Oh, good. Um, you were talking about the conceptual mind and uh, an English word for it, but. Uh, and you're talking about the pre-verbal conceptual mind, I think. Yes, that's yes, right. And English is such a primitive language, really, when it comes to anything that's not outside. Anything that's outside, we're very sophisticated. We know we've got names for everything, but for things inside, we don't really have very many names, or for philosophical concepts, for that matter. Um, so, I don't know, I wonder if maybe now that you've given me the job of trying to think of something I will, but I always wonder if whether it's better just sometimes to use the Sanskrit word. Well, I, I, you know, I'm glad you're studying Sanskrit. I know you're, you're doing that. Um, I think sometimes we just have to learn some of the original vocabulary because uh, it was developed out of people's uh, actual experience and, and the subtleties. So, you know, I, I think sometimes we just have to do that or the, you know, or Tibetan or something like that, um, because uh, uh, in common English usage, the, this, it's, it's very, um, you know, limited like that. So um, uh, I'll, I'll take it upon myself too, Dirk. I, I, this has been, um, thinking about a lot because um, uh, I've been reading um, uh, translated text down by Nippon about, um, uh, you know, uh, self-reflective consciousness, right? So um, uh, 
the translator now. Now I'm forgetting his name, British guy, you know, he's a very uh, good translator. Um, so I'm going to look for that too. But I, I have wanted to do a kind of a dictionary of trying to get, line up all these words that are around that kind of um, uh, problem of, uh, and come up with the English equivalents and Tibetan equivalents like that. Uh, that would, would be. I would like to do that too. Uh, yeah. Part of the part of the issue, what what I'm learning uh, by studying Sanskrit is how little I know about everything, uh, and just how sophisticated that language is, and how deep. So, they have, by the time we get to, even by the time we get to an early Buddhist concept, we've already got layers of meaning that that not only is English not aware of, but that we can never, we can never pick up from the word. So it seems like, like every word needs like a, at least a paragraph, if not a book, almost. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, and it needs discussion. Um, as some people know, and you know, Dirk knows, like when um, uh, Dharma went to the different cultures, uh, translators uh, worked uh, together, you know, so they could bounce these ideas around. Uh, there might be a major translator, um, but there, there was always a team, you know. So that's why, um, uh, you know, there's a translation team that, um, you know, I think formed in Nepal, Padmakara. You know, it's done a number of good translations like Bodhisattva Chari Vatara and folks like that. Uh, uh, to go, Yamshe, I think, put it together and the Chokin has continued, you know, so, but, it, but a team of people that um, need to work together. So, um, Dirk, you and I can work together on that and bounce off and maybe Ramatani would have an idea. But uh, language is constantly evolving, but just to have one word like concept. You know, um, just like even to have one word of like you translate every single knowledge word as wisdom, I, it's it gets too flat, don't you think? Well, you wind up not having any idea what's being said. Yes, everything becomes everything, and you know, we lose the immediacy in the experiential sense. Uh, so, of course, in tantra, you know, the way we use language, we try to make it like poetry, so that the words and the experience have, have some aliveness, right? Uh, same way in, um, uh, particularly in Dzogchen, when we're reading Shalkar or, um, or Pacharam Shade, that even in translation, the words seem alive, don't you think? So uh, when, when the words are actually connected to uh, a lived person, lived experience, then it really makes it real. But, uh, I don't want to banish the word concept, but um, for me, it, it carries too many Kantian Hegelian overtones. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes when I'm reading Buddhist texts, it feels like I'm reading Leibniz all over again. I'm, uh, I'm in another world altogether, right? So, um, My Sanskrit teacher talks a lot about translation and how and the challenges of it. And I asked her, and she said, don't do this. And I said, so we can't use hybrid Buddhist English? She thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> so uh, one of the things I think over the last uh, political administration and the current situation, uh, health-wise, political-wise, words do matter, right? So words can uh, point us to experience or express experience, can excite people or, or calm them down. Uh, so a uh, big part of Dharma always has been uh, speech. Uh, you know, what we have, uh, uh, you know, they say usually the, the most important thing coming from the Buddha is speech, right? And uh, the Buddhas just teach. So um, uh, even at the time of the Buddha, uh, be very careful how we use our speech and uh, try to be articulate. So we'll work on that, okay? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it.
My question um, goes a little bit with what Ellen was saying. Yeah. Um, a few weeks ago, when you were doing your uh, teaching on craving, I believe craving, it was, yeah. you had mentioned um, when that occurs to use your wisdom mind. And that, that was sort of how you solved that. And so uh, I've been doing that, like, especially if you're like spending money, I'll catch myself basically and say okay i'm using my wisdom mind to not do that uh -huh. is that a time when you would maybe sit and do the introspection yes that you were talking about yeah yeah okay. so uh the you know the, the introspection uh really starts in uh tranquility meditation so that uh, you know, you know, we're when we're doing shamatha practice, we have uh, the mindfulness uh, uh, function, which is not forgetting what we're doing, uh, but then the introspection aspect is uh, seeing the quality, right? And uh, these uh, functions are gradually enhanced and cultivated, right? The quality of the wisdom mind. Well, when we're paying attention to something, uh, you know, we're, we're noticing through introspection whether uh, we're out of balance or not, right? Whether we're tending towards excitement or tending toward dullness, um, we're beginning to notice uh, you know, subtle laxity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is different than dullness. <clears throat> yeah. But uh, all the um, functionings of awareness are there at the very beginning, but uh, they're, they're not uh, developed enough. So it was really funny, like, uh, we're perfect just as we are, and we need to improve ourselves. <laughs> but when they say improvement, I just say with joke, it's really it's cultivation, it's bhavana, because uh, the, the plant is there but uh, it still needs uh, cultivation. That's part of the human experience is to um, train to naturalness. It's, you can't just leave babies in the woods, they wouldn't learn language, right? Right, it's been tried. So, I'm gonna let Andrew have two questions in the same session. <laughs> That didn't, that was. <clears throat> so I was thinking about grasping an aversion and I just had a, a thought that came to mind that I wonder if aversion comes before grasping in the sense that grasping is about, it's not okay as is. And I, I, want, it, I want to avoid that feeling. I want to enhance feeling with the beer at the pool or the, <clears throat> the item or whatever it is. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that interplay between aversion and grasping. And does one perceive the other or am I totally off on that? You're totally off. <laughs> <laughs> so technically, you know, on if we're talking on kind of on the Dharma level uh, or dependent origination, birth and death level, um, you know, grasping is, uh, we, we just want it to continue as is. Beyond what it would normally be. Or we, we want, we want something to be, you know, we're, we're, we're holding when we shouldn't be holding. So it's, it's not, aversion is just anger like that. Um, so the, the grasping is a sense of holding. Or fixation, so um, it's it's not like I mean, what did you say originally? It's not like I don't. What was the original? It's not okay as is, like uh, um, or maybe it's I, I want this. Yeah, so I guess grasping is more. I want to hold it as is. Um, uh, we usually wouldn't say it that way in formal dharma, like. Uh, it, it's it's the it's the experience of uh, 
holding and making a mistake at the same time. So um, uh, I wouldn't, mess, you know, I wouldn't say it's not not accepting it as it is. So what you're thinking? Well, yeah, I'm also just wondering how much, of course, it's relating to that sense of self and um, it, it kind of seems like it, at all that a lot of it flows from the me aspect of things, right? Well, the, the Buddha, you know, the Buddha said, you know, that uh, a real problem is you have Atma Graha, you know, we're asking to, you know, fixation that we hold on to and believe to be true, that we have an independent and existing self. So in the American mindfulness movement, you know, a lot of times everything boils down to not accepting things as they are, right? Um, which is the blanket truth, of course, that's, that's why uh, we have samsara. Um, but in the American mindfulness movement, everything means everything sometimes. So we're, you know, I wouldn't define grasping this as that. You know, the overall problem, of course, is we don't see things as they are. And we're developing the uh, intuitive wisdom, the non-dual wisdom, uh, to see things as they are. So it, it, of course, it does come down to that. But when we're specifically talking about uh, grasping, it's, you know, we, we desired something and uh, you know, then we want to keep it. So uh, Trung Phu Nguyen had very good metaphors, you know, it's like uh, we, we want the hot dog uh, at the ball game and then we, we, we crave it and then we just chew it up and then it's gone, but we still we're still hanging on to it. We still want it. So it has that, you know, we want our cake and eat it too kind of thing. So there's a delusion there. So you could say, well, we're not accepting that, um, you know, the hot dog, the cake is gone now, right? But not accepting things that are is, is kind of the blanket um, big problem, which covers everything, actually. So. But uh, we have to look into ourselves like when, when, in, you know, when are we becoming fixated phenomenologically, so to speak, with our hot dogs, but then when are we fixated on these really deep structures where we think we know who we are and we think we know who others are when we're some examined, you know. But, you know, like, uh, <laughs> so, um, only the, there's a um, may have passed away, but a famous, uh, well, not famous, but wonderful scholar, uh, Lewis Lancaster, who mostly in uh, East Asian Buddhism, whether it's Chinese, Japanese, but he did a study of um, comparisons between uh, uh, Dzogchen and Zen, right? Uh, Dzogchen is able to have nice discussions with him. And, um, he was talking about how uh, the, um, maybe it was Nepal or India, I can't remember, but um, uh, he, was, he was asking uh, uh, Rinpoche about, um, can you still hear me okay? My voice is getting up. He was asking Rinpoche about grasping, right? <laughs> so uh, I really had a uh, camera with him. So Rinpoche said, you know, um, yeah, or, yeah, but can I see your camera? Um, and can I have this camera like this? And uh, so taking some pictures, and we thought that was kind of funny. And, okay, that's cool. And so they were talking about grasping. And then uh, Dr. Lancaster said, Well, I gotta go now. So um, put out your hand. And, uh, what do you think happened? Didn't get it back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did get it back, of course, but you know, it's like that. Like we can have conceptual, to use that term, you know, we can talk about it, but then like right there in the moment, um, you know, that, there's the grasping to that camera is mine, right? So uh, 
it's it's not phenomena like of course he recognizes a camera so you're accepting camera but um you know like that you've got to feel that sense right there to really get a hold on it excuse the pun you know because it's not until you start you know doing this right it's it's of course most painfully worked out in personal relationships where there's the power of struggle, tug of war, right? So, you know, grasping. Very, very intense. Good question. So, we're, we're kind of coming to an end. This has been really helpful. One last complaint or comment. Okay. I'm having a pretty difficult time conceptualizing uh, what you're saying about the word concept. And uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I'm pretty worried with uh, what I've been studying lately because it's talking a lot about conceptual mind. And I think that my, from hearing you, I'm maybe looking at that uh, wrong in terms of Dharma. Could you say it again, the difference between how as Americans were defining conceptualization and how we should think of it in Dharma? Um, well, the mistake would be uh, defining conceptualization as any kind of mental activity that has a language or discrimination involved. That would be a mistake, right? So some people take a very quietistic, like the only way to be non-conceptual is just totally be silent. Of course, the Buddha was silent with many questions, right? But um, that would that would be misuse. So there's there's um, you know thinking that involves conceptualization. There's thinking that is doesn't. So when we're talking about conceptualization in this negative way, it's it's a, a misperception. That's at the very at the root. So, pardon me? Uh, language isn't the boogeyman. Yeah, so that's that's important. Language is, is just, uh, it can be used falsely or correctly. Uh, um, in um, an example of conceptualization uh, can be how um, uh, universals are um, misunderstood. Uh, when eventually, which I hope we will get to Dignaga and Dharmakirti and talking about uh, universals. Uh, it's a big thing in Western philosophy too. So example is um, mis misunderstanding is uh, this is from Oxford English um, uh, folks. Like the example is someone comes to uh, Oxford and says, you know, I, I want to see the university, right? And so they go to the uh, admissions and they take them to, they've got, here's the classrooms, here's the dormitories, here's the gymnasium, here's uh, quad, here's the chapel, here's uh, everything, and then um, they take them back to after the tour, and uh, um, Dean or whoever says, well, how do you like the university? And the person says, well, that's fine, but I didn't see the university. And the Dean goes, well, what do you mean? Well, you showed me the chapel, you showed me the quad, you showed me the classrooms and so forth, but you didn't show me the university. So there's a misunderstanding there, right? That, that's what we're talking about. There's a problem there, right? So uh, uh, the sense of universal was seen as uh, totally distinct from particulars, right? So there's a big problem. But also, is a conceptual mind um, problem because uh, when I was doing a lot of work 
sometimes I've mentioned this example of the people uh, with people with developmental disabilities work in an agency where people would get trained to do some of the jobs, you know, people sort of like applied industries, right, maybe. So there was one woman I was working with and we had her go to train on um, cash register so she could work at Target. So we found cash registers that were the same, you know, and what they were called in the old days, you know, wasn't the, you know, going to Target, that's the cash register, right? So trained on it and um, did really well, right? You said 100%. Okay. Or sending you to Target. And you always go with the job coach, right? So show somebody I heard the story. So what happened when she got to the Target and, you know, actually kind of on the job and in front of the cash register, what do you think happened? Nobody? Right. So there's no sense of universal at all. That, that you know, because we were thinking, of course, you, you know, the, I wasn't there, but our job developer and job coach would say, this is the same. And she goes, it's not the same. So a uh, real sense of misplaced concreteness, right? Just totally in concrete operation, we'd say PJ style. So um, that, like, there's no idea of universals. Well, that's a hard life too, right? Misunderstanding universal, and then you don't even have a universal sense. That's a hard life, right? So, so much of uh, when we're talking about conceptual mind, we're not just talking about misunderstanding, thinking that you know, something is blue when it's really red, or thinking that something exists when it doesn't exist, but uh, we, we don't know how to work with uh, universals and particulars. So that's something that, you know, uh, and of course, Nagarjuna got uh, to and uh, kind of my Dhamaka way, but uh, we'll also be looking at with Dhamma KT. We misuse universals all the time, and we misuse particulars all the time, and that would be an example of, uh, uh, you know, we should say misconceptual mind like that. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. It is. I mean, yeah. it brings up a lot more questions about like sample size and things like this and how we can uh, actually have faith in particulars, but <laughs> I'm sure that's a different class. Traditional training uh, in Vajana, um, of course, you'd have a lot of support. You might be in a retreat center or a monastery. So uh, in the first interview, <laughs> uh, one of your preceptors or teachers, they would say, everything you know is wrong. <laughs> so we're just like, you know, forget it, everything you know is wrong like that. Like we're totally gonna like that. So we don't have that luxury, right? So we have to work and we have to kind of can't totally lock everything clean, right? You go, well, I know nothing, and then you know, we have to. So that's a good. Uh, we should close here. It's been really uh, nice to see everybody. Hope I talk up enough. Right? What do you think, Charlotte? Okay. Thank you, Lama. It was a fantastic talk. Um, so maybe we could get people closer and I can learn to talk up more too, right? So let's do dedication and uh, we'll close. Oh yeah, so uh, I'm gonna stick around. So if, if people are interested in uh, Salung practice, uh, we can do that. Uh, and uh, I'm also gonna be here for uh, mindful recovery. So I'm here all day. So if you feel like you wanna hang out and say hi, also I'm here. Kapish. Sa means channels. No means like wind. Delay means like drops. Salang, you know, so it's some, um, you know, uh, a form of uh, Buddhist yoga. So it is um, becoming more popular. I've been doing like a little research just for fun, 
like on YouTube. Oh my God. <laughs> so we'll try to do some authentic practice. Okay, so let's do dedication. Through the merit of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel of bodhicitta that not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land that's circled by snow mountains, where the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chinrezi, Tenzin Gatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. May the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losan, magical display of a deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instruction to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. This great treasure of objectless compassion, and usury, master of flawless wisdom, Vajapana, destroyer of the entire host, Mara, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losandrapa, I make request at your holy feet. <laughs>